My name is Blue Head. It's November 5th, one day before the election. I'm going to stop concentrating on the election because based on what I see on the news channels and on my computer screens and the polls, I have no idea who's going to win. And that's a good thing. It's not a foregoing conclusion on the winning candidate. It's close enough, it seems, this time where it actually might be fair. I know that in 2008, there were a lot of shenanigans uh, on behalf of the incumbent, at least his party, maybe not himself. But the Democrats did some pretty underhanded things. My machines are going crazy. Uh, the, the Democrats and the Republicans both did some pretty anti-American things and messed around with our voting system and the protocol we use to elect public officials. Shameful, really. Shameful. This is America. You know, we're supposed to be setting the example for the world and that we're cheating ourselves out of a proper election process is embarrassing but be that as it may I can't fix it I can't control it you can't control it so somebody's gonna have to this time it seems they're paying attention you know there were reports last time 2008 on voter fraud and voter manipulation, um, who's counting what, how many people are voting twice, intimidation at the booths, all these various scare tactics to get people to vote one way or the other based on their candidacy and their proponents for the candidacy. You know what? It's just un-American to intimidate people to vote one way or the other. They, you're supposed to have the freedom to vote in this country. And if you don't have the privacy of your own head, then we might as well move to a autocratic government society where the government decides everything for us. Because that's what that's all about. A higher power ruling, controlling what we think. If I go to a booth and I'm going to vote for Billy Graham, if he's running, and the non-Christians, here we go with church and state, non-Christians don't want me to vote for Billy Graham, they start threatening me with uh, Stars of David or whatever in their hand and they're going to hit me over the head. Or the Koran if they're Islamic. This is absurdity. I'm going to vote for who I think represents the best CEO leadership potential for this country. And right now we need a CEO. And we need a commander-in-chief with a pair of cojones. Not a war starter, but a war preventer. A guy who is sensitive, compassionate, and all-knowing as much as he can be as a human being and is tolerant of every country's individual needs but he has a big sledgehammer or a bazooka strapped to his leg and says listen I'm not gonna start a fight but if you're gonna start one I'm gonna finish it so let's sit down and break bread have peace but because of human nature being what it is, we know there's ample room for intolerance, and ample room for greed, and ample room for violation of boundaries. Boundaries of decency, boundaries of right and wrong, boundaries of good and evil. We're gonna stay inside our boundaries. That's the way we've survived as a species on this planet for the last 
25,000 years that we've been able to record, at least research our history as the dominant species, Homo sapiens. I want to talk today about hydrofracking. This happens to be my subject matter expertise. This is what I do. So I've been doing for 35 to 40 years, in addition to being a commercial fisherman. That's my passion, avocation. This is my vocation. This is my professional skill set. Uh, I'm an environmental remediation analyst. What does that mean? I'll make it simple. When our manufacturing and oil producing companies in the United States leak chemicals into the ground or on the water for both venues, my job was to clean it up. I'm a janitor. You leak chemicals in the ground, you poison water supplies, I fix it. That's my job. That's what I did for 35 years. I did it really well. I'm very passionate about it because we all need clean water. Um, I'm very, I was very passionate about the oil spill side because I love my oceans. I'm a captain. I'm a fisherman. And I was born right on the sea. So this is my home. Crabs, clams, oysters, lobsters, finfish, tuna swordfish, all of these animals are the animals I grew up with and the animals I harvested throughout my life and have eaten since I was a baby. So I want to protect our oceans. I want to protect the wildlife in our oceans, the whales, the tuna, the clams, the lobsters, the bugs, all of them, the algae, they all have to live in order for the ecosystem to thrive. We also want to protect our water supply because our animals in the forest, who I also love, as well as ourselves, needs clean water. We need clean water. Now, I'm going to give you a perspective that might be a little weird. But I want you to step back again and not be myopic and not be closed-minded. The Earth herself, Mother Earth, when she's ready, and you've heard this before, probably from George Carlin or some other um, quasi-political pundit and comedian, the Earth herself will shake us off like a gnat when she's ready. We can't hurt the Earth itself. We can't hurt her. It's human arrogance to think we can hurt her. She is so much more powerful than us as a species. And, and we just saw that in New York, okay? Mother Nature just breathed a slight sigh of discontent on the metropolitan area. And she knocked us on our ass. She just went, oh, and we got knocked on our ass. Just a little puff. All right. If she takes a deep breath and blows hard because she's angry, we're dead. Mother Earth rules our existence. She rules it. Don't ever think otherwise. I don't care who you are, what you have in weaponry, nuclear bombs. Mother Earth will not be affected by this species. She's way too powerful. What we're going to kill is ourselves and the other animals who happen to share the planet with us. Not fair to them that we choose their fate. They will die. We will die. The earth will prevail. In a million years, she'll be fully healed and complete again, and we'll be starting over again. And we're going to start out as primordial ooze, and then we have to evolve again. And I don't know if I'm going to come back in that slime next time. I think I will, but I'm not sure. But I know that I'm here now. So because I'm here now, I'm going to do as much as I can before we do kill ourselves. To prevent us from killing everything. 
I work for the oil companies, the big bad oil companies, all my life, since I was 18 years old. They spilled oil into the ocean. I cleaned it up in the wintertime. And I say the wintertime because my harbor was frozen. I couldn't get my fishing boat out. Had I had the, the option of fishing year-round, I would have. But various things stop that. Abundance, seasonal feeding cycles. So I went to work for an oil spill company. And in the wintertime, when there's a lot of fuel moving around, both on the ocean and on land, they spilled a lot of it. And after the Clean Water Act, passed by Nixon in 72, thank you, Mr. Nixon, you were forced to clean it up. But that's not what drove the cleanups. What drove the cleanups is the price of fuel was now too expensive to spill. Before the Clean Water Act, uh, crude was very cheap. So they didn't care if they lost a thousand barrels into the ocean. Well, guess what? Now it's expensive. It used to be 20 bucks a barrel and less. Now it's 100. And it should be 70, of course, but you know, when it's $10 a barrel, $5 a barrel, that's what? 10 cents a gallon for crude? Not a lot of numbers. It doesn't bother them that much when they spill it. Well, now it's expensive, so it's too expensive to spill. Let's spill it they do, and spill it they did. And cleaning up that mess underground, as far down as 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet. That's the technology that I pioneered with many other smart people, my associates, my family. We pioneered technologies to get the chemicals out of the deep earth when they got leaked there by various mechanisms on the surface. Pipelines, pumping stations, refineries, gasoline stations, fuel terminals, name it. Chemical manufacturing plants, Superfund sites leak chemicals into the earth and poison the water. This is what we did. This was our calling. We pioneered technologies, both drilling and recovery and remediation so that we could correct the damage. And I wanna focus on fracking. I only have another minute or two left in this cycle. So I'm gonna make another installment right after this so I can tell you about hydrofracking. Sometimes they get carried away with the historical aspects of what I've been discussing because I'm so impassioned by it as an American, as a patriot, that I can't contain myself. I'm a little bit like Governor Christie, except I might be just a little bit more tempered. Um, and I wish they'd lay off the guy by the way. Lay off the guy. The president came to see him. He's still the president of the United States. Chris Christie showed him some courtesy and cordiality for showing up. That respect is due our president. I don't care if it's Bozo the Clown who gets elected. He deserves the respect of the presidency. It doesn't mean Chris is going to vote for him, of course. But lay off the guy. Lay off him. He was cordial. He was thankful, as he should be. Obama's a busy guy. He didn't have to stop in Jersey. Proves at least he's got a heart. And I do believe he does have a heart. In any case, I have to sign off because this installment is over. YouTube won't give me any more than 15 minutes. So I'm going to post this and I'll be right back with another. I'll call it Chronicle 2, November 5th. Stay tuned.